Welcome to Union Plus debate on the EU-Russia relations. Our program today is presented from the Citizens Corner concept. The debate is produced and hosted by Union Plus and Latvian Radio, a member of the Union Plus network. The debate can be followed live in the European Parliament on our Union Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag Citizens Corner. I'm Brian McGuire. Joining us today to discuss uh, Europe's icy standoff with Russia, Ion Mesu Basco, an MEP from Romania from the Social Democrats and Vice President of the European Parliament, Elmar Brock, MEP from Germany, European uh, People's Party, Chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, Petrus Ostervicius from uh, a Lithuanian MEP and Vice Chair of the Liberals in the European Parliament and a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, Tomasz Mezeriks, MEP from Hungary and the Greens, a former a, a Foreign Affairs Shadow Rapporteur on the report on the state of EU Russian relations, and hopefully we'll be joined by Dr. Fraser Cameron from the Director uh, of the EU Russian. Center. We also have two of our students with us today from Poland and from Romania, Camille and uh, Tamea. Thank you for joining us all. Uh, these are interesting days. Uh, Mr. Putin uh, is disturbing as much of the Western Hemisphere as he possibly can. Elmer Brock, why do you think uh, Putin is uh, satisfied with this uh, low-grade conflict uh, that he has a series of going on across the, the world? I do not think that he's happy because he knows the cost of it. He what is the cost? The cost is the cost of the war, for example. The war in Syria is very expensive. Uh, the, he has to look after that country afterwards. He didn't do it in Afghanistan. The Russians didn't do it. They didn't look after it. These walked away from it afterwards. Yeah, but then he, if he will walk out of Syria, then he has lost all his influence in Syria. Yep. Then the price was even higher. <coughs> because of his political positions and we should not let him out of the cost. It cannot be that he solves that problem militarily, destroying the Geneva talks, and at the same time ask the West to look after the uh, uh, humanitarian uh, questions and uh, to uh, rebuild the country. He has to take his chair. The war in Ukraine is very expensive for him, both the war itself and the sanctions. So he cannot be very happy if he thinks a little bit more than uh, half a year ahead. Thomas, what do you think he gains from this? There's so much trouble, so much expense. What's the benefit? Well, basically, the net benefit is that he proves what everybody knew, that he could be a spoiler anywhere. Uh, but that doesn't make Russia a global power. It makes uh, Russia a quasi-regional spoiler, which we are going to have a long-term long problem with, but this is not necessarily going to be a global issue. Actually, I believe at the moment this is our biggest problem, that this is not a global issue, either Syria or, uh, or the Ukraine. It's a regional issue and we are not fully prepared to uh, have our say in it. Ian Pesco, is this a, because it's a regional issue, the Americans are not getting involved because there's no direct threat to them, but then Mikhail Gorbachev says, pay attention, you're heading towards nuclear war. Well, when you speak about two powers which uh, have the largest arsenals, nuclear arsenals, uh, there is always this danger there. Uh, even if uh, the confrontation is not uh, to the levels existing during the Cold War. But the, the danger is there, and we have to take that into account. Now, uh, there is a certain basis for such an assertion on the part of Mr. Gorbachev. Because lately, uh, the declarations coming from the Russian part, mentioning the possibility of using nuclear weapons, have multiplied. Practically every, every important uh, thing which is disturbing them is threatened with the nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm coming from a country which has uh, part of the anti-missile system in De Veselu, a system which is totally defensive and so limited in numbers that really does not matter, does not interfere with the strategic balance. And still, the Russians are threatening uh, nuclear weapons against this uh, objective. So I think, you know, that there is a certain... Uh, we should pay attention to this, but at the same time, at the same time, if we cross that threshold, then it's over. Uh, not only for Russia, uh, for everybody. Okay, Be Petros Ostericius, why do you think that Putin continues to push? Is he, is he trying to find the absolute limits of Western uh, authority, where his own authority uh, can be pursued? Or is this simply a matter that he's trying to uh, keep his own image alive at home? Well, we have to admit that uh, Putin has failed in uh, economy. 
economy of Russia relied uh, exclusively on a high uh, oil prices. With uh, oil market uh, in collapse being very low, economy is not diversified. I mean, uh, it's, it's not a competitive economy. And with the growing uh, dissatisfaction in the economic policies, I think it was uh, a strategic uh, decision of Putin, I mean, to move uh, away from domestic policies to foreign policies and to challenge uh, exclusively the Western uh, Hemisphere. And uh, in his uh, target uh, are Western values. So that's why at the expense of uh, failure in, uh, domestically, he has chosen uh, another enemy, I call it uh, enemy as us, uh, presenting us as uh, somebody who wants to conquer uh, Russia. And he's very successful in positioning uh, uh, the West as uh, a major troublemaker for, for Russia. And being in complete control of media, and state media dominates uh, Russian uh, uh, media market, he's completely uh, in, in charge of uh, all major messages and narrative uh, in, in Russia. Elmar Brock, it seems that he's also in control of some of the Western media as well, whether directly or indirectly, and the hacking in the United States uh, in the election uh, material as well, and the, the DNC. Is this just an attempt to disrupt and to degrade confidence in Western institutions, or is this actually an attempt to change uh, electoral outcomes or something more? Look, this is the strength and the weakness of a democratic society. We have different opinions. That is our strength. Even it might be misused by Mr. Putin. But at the end of the day, freedom always wins. And we have to be confident in that. And uh, explain our position and then we will win that battle. But uh, we cannot stop opposition to that by force, as Putin does it. But as he does it by force, uh, that opposition has no chance, opposition papers, uh, uh, TV stations have no chance, he loses more control in the long run about his own population. And uh, the alternative is not uh, to give in to that, but uh, to fight it. Uh, Thomas Freeman writing in the New York Times saying, we need to give Putin a taste of his own medicine. And that doesn't necessarily mean military intervention, but we need to be demonstrating to the Western population that we're attacking their uh, cyberspace as well, that they were influencing their media, that we're able to do what they're doing here. Should we do that? No. Why? Because it's uh, attacking the cyberspace is an aggressive act. Should, and should it's, ag it's, it's against international law. And that we Only if you're caught. Hmm? Only if you're caught. Yeah, but nevertheless, we are the people under the rule of law. That's the difference. Okay. Thomas, uh, the John Kerry was caught uh, off record speaking uh, in, at the United Nations to some Syrian uh, representatives. And, and exactly as, as uh, Elmer Brock was saying, is that he said to them, we have to respect the rule of law. The Russians don't do that. That's why we're at a disadvantage and we can't do anything else. What can he do? At this moment, it's uh, relatively late. I mean, what, what could have been done was uh, about two years ago. Uh, that would have been the optimal moment for, uh, for the United States to intervene if it ever decided to intervene. Uh, the bad news was that it never made up its mind about whether to intervene or not. That, and that was the worst possible outcome, even worse than declaring from the outset that we are not going to intervene. Um, so it is relatively late in the game. I'm uh, not sure whether there is any feasible military option for the United States other than what is nobody going and, and ever did in an election year that is full force uh, engagement in, uh, in Syria. That, that being unlikely, I think currently that assessment is, is on the spot for the capabilities. Ian yeah, Pascu, when we look at what can be done, what should be done? Is it, are we talking about more sanctions, as uh, some people were calling for you, uh, yesterday? Malcolm Rifkin, the foreign, uh, former British Foreign Secretary, for example, uh, uh, Carl Bildt as well, he, he put his name to this. Should there be more sanctions, deeper sanctions? Is it the only way to hurt Putin or to control Putin with the economy? Well, you know, as uh, Elmar has mentioned, you know, the sanctions are biting and he's still in the game. And uh, more than that, he managed, you know, to uh, enlist the support of his population by proclaiming, you know, that the country is under assault. It's the same situation like in the early 40s, and we have to unite and we have to resist and so on and so forth, which is a narrative uh, which resonates with the Soviet Russian population. But at the same time, I think that uh, it is the only way. 
I mean, if we do not do that, then what else? Because uh, Putin and the Russians in general do not respect anything but force, sheer force. So is it economic? It's preferable than being military. Uh, and they are like, a, like an anaconda, which is suffocating, you know, gradually uh, the prey. It's not a question, you know, you s jump at the juggler and you kill the prey. No, this is a sort of the economic sanctions are always like, uh, like an anaconda strangling, you know, the, the victim. At one point, uh, the victim would probably have to, uh, to, touch, uh, to touch the environment and ask for, uh, for a truce. Maybe not Mr. Putin. But I'm sure, you know, that uh, there will be others probably who would uh, consider this more seriously than he does. Okay, the anaconda analogy I like, because Russia seems to strangle itself every 30 years, every 40 years as well. Is there a natural cycle in Russian politics which creates this uh, cleansing of, of dictatorship only to regrow it again? I think, I think you know, that we have to take uh, also a historical look. And we'll see that Russia has been down and then up and then down and then up. So somehow, you know, this is a country with huge resources which can be mobilized and uh, they can help, you know, the leadership to overcome such difficult moments. So if there is a certain change, this will come in time and it will accumulate. Okay. Uh, we cannot expect, you know, a sudden move uh, from this respect. At the same time, at the same time, how does Russia function without being centralized? So there were three systems which kept the Soviet Union okay. together. It was the gas, it was the NKVD, I mean the KGB, and it was the army. And now, who are the systems which are keeping Russia together? The okay. same system, more or less. The, the media is reporting to the, uh, these last few days about Putin having $30 billion uh, dollar inheritance for his children eventually, because he's not going to be able to keep this, and somebody's got to come after him. What happens when Putin goes? Let me ask uh, here. Petrus. Well, I don't know how rich uh, Mr. Putin is, but um, I believe in some reports that he might be the richest man uh, on, on earth. And it might be possible. I mean, as long as you control such a resources rich country and you can control those who export uh, them on international markets uh, vastly, of course, you can get rich in a year or two years' time. But, uh, you know, Mr. Putin succeeded to uh, bring his entourage into power and to make them rich. I mean, everybody who comes close and uh, gets uh, a, a certain trust and promotion, uh, even recently there have been stories as uh, his previous cook was promoted, I mean, uh, to uh, ranks, uh, he's in chef. control of... Uh, Is he a uh, chef? No, I mean, his he used uh, to work at McDonald's. One of, probably he <laughs> worked previously, it doesn't matter what you did uh, previously, but if you are in... Uh, in trust, and you, if you are given uh, exclusive monopo uh, monopoly, I mean, uh, and Russia still is a big country, so I mean, you, you can make millions. So I don't believe that uh, Mr. Putin uh, uh, only himself represents uh, that system. The system might reproduce him, uh, itself and install another man like Putin. I don't uh, think, I mean, he might be better of wars, but he will be in control of that system because, I mean, if system crumbles, I mean, they all lose, and uh, this is an uh, old school of uh, so-called Siloviki yeah. and yeah. Uh, oligarchs and, and the rest. I mean, it's well-built, uh, interlinked uh, by KGB methods, double-checked, and efficient system. Okay. You know, I mean, the West can't uh, compete with that system because everything in Russia is so personalized and built on uh, individualities. Okay, Elmer Brock. Do you think that do, <laughs> uh, do you think that this is a matter of dealing with Don Corleone and that really we're just waiting for a change of generation, but things will stay the same? We do not know what is going on in Russia in that sense. I think look for a regime change um, might that we have to wait for a long time in that question, and therefore I believe it's very much important that we continue to tell that aggression is expensive. And then at some point the Russian have to make a choice. And uh, if there is, they can only reform the economy via Europe, not via China. They have not a self-reliant economy. The the industry is in a worse situation than in the 80s. No reforms, old machines, and only relying uh, relying on on on, uh, on gas and oil exports. 
makes it worse from every cycle to every cycle. So can Europe help Russia out of this impasse by making Russia wealthier, by helping Russia yeah, we're get richer? Way. We were negotiating the second generation of partnership agreement and the modernization program, which was exactly going that direction to help to rebuild uh, or to build the industry uh, and to make uh, developing an own self-reliant industry. China, for example, has done that. Uh, so China has a self-reliant industry. Russia still is on big conglomerates, which were in the past state-owned. Now they are privatized, but uh, belong to the Kremlin. And nothing has changed, uh, with the exception that few people became richer. Uh, but uh, uh, the competitiveness did not become better. And uh, this is, I think, it goes forward and forward. He knows it perfectly. He loses the heart of these young people. He tries to buy them by nationalities ideas and make these big speeches and uh, uh, using military means that we are now back as a world power. But uh, Helmut Schmidt just comes to my mind. He said about the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is a, is a Capo Verde with nuclear means. It has nothing changed. Okay. <laughs> Thomas, Gorbachev also said the partnerships between the West and Russia should really focus on climate uh, and fighting international terrorism as well. Are these diplomatic routes that should really be maxed out at the moment? Well, coming from a Green Party, you wouldn't be surprised if I'm saying that uh, co uh, collaboration on uh, climate issues is the foremost uh, responsibility towards humankind. That's not an issue uh, uh, of international relations simply. That's a question of life and death for all humanity in the long run. And especially, actually, uh, Russia could be the hardest hit uh, relatively soon uh, with the permafrost regions uh, thawing up. Uh, actually, uh, climate change can hit Russia to the double than, than what we experience here uh, in, uh, in Europe. But uh, the point is that for that, you also need a credible uh, leadership. Climate change negotiations are difficult. Uh, agreements are difficult to verify. Uh, therefore, what you need is a reliable and credible leadership. And at this moment, uh, Putin's Russia is not exactly that. Well, he seems pretty reliable and predictable in one sense. <laughs> Let me bring uh, one of our students. To, to May, do you have a question for our panel? Uh, yes, I have one question. Uh, if the credibility of the European Union among uh, uh, its member states continues to decrease, would uh, Vladimir Putin or the Russia could take advantage of that? Ian yeah, Pesco first. Well, he does uh, even without that. Uh, he's trying to divide and uh, rule. He has always been doing that. He was talking, you know, very uh, to engage more or less Brussels. But then, you know, the main talk has been in the capitals. This has been before Crimea and after Crimea with the hybrid war and all those tactics. This has only been amplified. So I think, you know, that um, you mentioned, you know, that uh, Kerry has mentioned, uh, has said uh, about the we respect the law. They don't. This is the policeman and the villain. The villain has always enjoying the advantage of not having to respect the law, while the policeman has to do that. Well, to my mind, it comes another film, which is uh, Party Crashers, uh, Wedding Crashers. <laughs> I'm so surprised Putin, you even seen Putin, that. Put, Putin <laughs> is such a party crusher. If I'm not invited, uh, then I'll crash your party. And actually, this is the, the game which is played internationally. Of course, you know, uh, we have to, and, and we don't, we shouldn't forget that Russia is a major actor in the international system and they have a potentially huge contribution to better this system, uh, not only to, to worsen it. Okay. Petrus, what would you do at this moment, given all the situations that we have, what would be your next step to make this uh, a better relationship with Russia and to detoxify? First of all, I mean, an excellent point uh, from um, uh, the Romanian student. I mean, unfortunately, indeed, uh, Russia is playing a zero-sum game. And they usually try to balance. And the um, best mean which we must employ on EU side is our unity. Is our unity and a strong position on uh, present and future relations uh, uh, with uh, the Russian uh, Federation. So as long as we are able, I mean, to construct our policy, on a solid basis and not to let uh, uh, nation states, I mean, to dominate um, with their 
economic interests, with some political interest, with some personalities uh, being more exposed, I mean, uh, to, to, to Russian, uh, let's say, attention and so on. So I think this is very important. I mean, what means will be chosen in the end? I mean, more sanctions, less sanctions, uh, partial uh, dialogue or um, more open dialogue. For me, it's less important. I think we can agree on those means as long as our unity is based on real strategy, but not on accidental uh, factors which play against us. Okay, our, our next student, uh, Camille, do you have a question for the panel? Yes, of course. Mm, my question is, how should we react as European Union for the next act of aggression from the Russian side? Elmer Brock. We have now this new consideration because of Syria. There was always an, someone who said be strict on Ukraine because of a violation of international law, do the sanctions there, but have a selective cooperation with uh, uh, Russia on Syria, on climate change, all about terrorism, what you mentioned. Uh, since two weeks, I believe that Russia is not ready for cooperation. They, will, they have destroyed the, uh, the negotiations for a peace. They look now for a military solution. They are part of the war, not part of the negotiation, the international negotiation team. And that shows that we have to change our policy in a certain way. Do you also, think I have to change my own opinion on that. I was wrong. I must say, I was wrong, and uh, therefore I would like to see that we have no considerations. The first message would be, I would like that the sanctions, if they have to prolong in January, uh, in December, will not prolong for half a year, but for a year. The same sanctions for a year. That makes a difference in message, that we mean it seriously. Uh, and the second point is, we have to look into the situation, what it means, for example, to set, uh, to bring uh, to Russia high technologies for computer industry, drilling, partly done, and especially for the military machinery, as it was until the 80s done. That might hurt to... Uh, and that might draw the attention. Yeah. Okay. That is not only broad economic one, but just on the point on such high technologies. Okay. Thomas, what, what do you think about Camille's question? What, how should Europe respond to the next act of aggression? Well, that partly depends on what the target of the action is. Uh, obviously, we should uh, have the same attitude to violation of international law wherever it happens, but it, it makes a difference, whether it's in a volatile region, whether it is direct military intervention or military intervention by proxy. So um, I don't think we can have a blanket solution for all of these eventualities. Uh, we have to respond differently to, to different types uh, of interventions. But what we have so far failed to mention is that what we have in our hands, namely the sanctions regime, is not just a reasonable tool, it's actually working surprisingly well. Uh, building up and then sustaining uh, a sanctions regime was ever one of the most difficult tasks uh, in international relations because there's just too many interests going in different directions. Simply the fact that Europe was able to keep the sanctions regime intact for so long period uh, is, I think, a, a signal of strength. Nobody uh, actually would have bet on that, that we are able to, to sustain sanctions regime so far. Pedro, you want to respond first? Yes, indeed. Uh, I think uh, our strength is solidarity, I mean, uh, which brings us I mean, to unity again. And uh, ability to employ means of deterrence. I am looking forward, uh, and I do promote uh, the European Union close uh, to uh, close uh, uh, activity with NATO. I mean, Warsaw Declaration is, is, is a document we have to I implement completely. I appreciate uh, some member states of, of NATO in mean, being able to deploy some uh, military units in, uh, in the neighborhood uh, which is, I would say, under permanent political uh, challenge. And uh, Iskander is uh, being deployed in Kaliningrad is one of the examples. I mean, we have to respond to, uh, and to show our strength, but based on political solidarity. This is the fundamental principle we can't overlook. And do, do you think that NATO is central to this? Every time NATO tries to expand or do something, and uh, Putin responds by saying he's terribly upset about NATO threatening them, <laughs> which we respond by saying, well, we're not threatening, we're just uh, preparing and doing what we should be doing. How do you get out of that cat and mouse game? Uh, you, should, uh, you should have started earlier, because you know NATO has taken certain, uh, certain uh, obligations, which it respected up to the point of, uh, and it still respects now, 
because the, all the troops which have been deployed and the uh, equipment and, uh, is on a rotational basis still. Uh, and that's, you know, respecting uh, the deals made uh, in the beginning. But the problem is something like this. Putin, Putin is doing what he's doing, annexing illegally Crimea, destabilizing uh, uh, eastern Ukraine. And here, you know, I'll make a parenthesis to note that the harshest sanctions are not for Crimea, are for the destabilization of eastern Ukraine. I close the parenthesis. Uh, but the problem is uh, here, you know, that uh, um, he's, um, he's uh, trying to somehow get out of this, get out of this. We should maintain this. And I think, you know, that what President uh, Roosevelt has mentioned, uh, talk nicely by Kerry, but Kerry, yeah, you know, stick. a big stick behind. Uh, this is important. But the logic of Mr. Putin is like this. Yes. I have taken Crimea, NATO responded to that, and then I'm saying to the population, see, NATO is expanding, what have I told you? This is the, the formula. Every time we respond, he transforms it into the first act to which he has to react. But should we care what they think in Russia about that, or should we just be preoccupied no, with our own defense? No, I, I am afraid only on one thing, you know, because the indoctrination which is taking place right now with the young generations in Russia, yes might have a residual effect and would prevent probably in time, you know, uh, rebuilding the bridges which are now burnt. Okay, Elmer Brock, uh, we're talking about indoctrination and the propaganda <coughs> war as well, and in St. Petersburg there's a warehouse full of uh, excellent hackers. <coughs> Can we subcontract them to work against Russia? Because we have like nine people at East Stratcom talking about how to protect our eastern borders from propaganda. This isn't working. How does Europe fight back? I think you cannot avoid propaganda in a free society. The uh, Russian position will be here. But we have to counteract it in that we, for example, in our own uh, society answer to that. Let not that go, not just by a press release. We do not use social media enough in this case. And we have to find new ways to infiltrate also uh, the Russian population. That costs money. We, Who's prepared to spend the money on it? Well, that we have, to, that have to pay the member states and the European Union. We have to do that, and we did that under that technological situation uh, via uh, Free Radio Europe, Deutsche Welle, and all these things. But that is uh, the instruments party of the past. But do you think you're going to get money for this when we can't get 2% uh, GDP for NATO membership? <laughs> I think we started to have that 2%. Yeah, but it's gradually. It's but gradually. that is not with 2%. Here we have to do anyway. That is another story is procurement. But we have to find a synergy effects on the European level. Not a 2% is not a figure that is like the millennium goals, uh, does not exist. Uh, but uh, the amount of money which has to be used for that and use proper instruments for that, that is not a question of costs okay. uh, so much. That is a question of political will and using also in a free society the new instrument of modern uh, co uh, communication which is used by the Russian state but we are not using, but it is even more difficult for us to use because we cannot send a unified opinion to Russia because that's not our style of a free region or a free country. But we, in have, sense we have there always different positions. That it's the, the difference. I want not to become like Russia. But the, the general values, with one or two exceptions currently, of the European Union is a unified position, what we stand for in terms of freedom of speech, of equality, things like that. These messages can go across the border relatively easily. Why isn't that done? It is done. And there are so many circles in Russia who talk to each other, but that has not a high standard at the moment in Russia. Uh, but they were successful with that uh, until the 80s, and the change uh, in 89, 90 had to do that this was taken by the people there. And you see a lot of demonstrations, and we had the people on the Maidan uh, calling for Europe and freedom was the success of this story. And here's exactly the point. Putin had this demonstration in... 2012 from his own people and then he looked into the faces of the people on the Maidan calling for freedom he is afraid that this will take over and there is doing partly this policy uh, in order to uh, uh, avoid that he is afraid of his young people okay Thomas Boris Johnson has been calling for uh, protest outside uh, the Russian embassy uh, we could talk about the merits of, of anything Boris Johnson says, but do you support the principle that uh, we should be protesting outside Russia's embassy? Is that going to achieve anything except irritation? 
I don't think that uh, that's the purview of elected politicians. Actually, if there is a vibrant civil society, there will be people who are going to do that, as they, this has been the case uh, in Western Europe for, for decades before. Uh, that's not the government or elected politicians' responsibility, I believe. Okay, Petrus, what do you think uh, should be done next? Should we be protesting outside embassies, or is there a better way for Europe, uh, European citizens to participate in this action? Why not? I mean, uh, the, we live in, in democratic societies, and uh, our citizens are, are free to choose uh, a form of protest. And uh, I do appreciate, I mean, the courage and uh, uh, consciousness of our um, uh, people who came uh, in front of the Russian uh, embassies and they um, indeed uh, express their will and, uh, and, and pass the message. It's, it's, it's absolutely important, I mean, uh, to... Uh, give a clear message on the right time, I mean, to uh, Russian state officials, diplomats, uh, who might uh, be then, uh, you know, rethinking uh, the uh, situation on the uh, on, on Western side. But coming back to the issue, I think we, uh, we should be very uh, employing very flexible policies. And I am in favor of opening more uh, access uh, for Russian youth to uh, Europe. I mean, they should see themselves, not we explain how we do things uh, uh, in the European Union, but them inviting to our countries and talking to them. Not all of them will be converted, let's say, from the Russian uh, uh, doctrine as, uh, uh, you know, as a castle which is uh, surrounded by uh, hostile forces, but some of them might come back and, uh, and become good messengers uh, of, uh, of us. We are for partnership, but look, I mean, we can't play football against rugby team. I mean, we will be beaten. I mean, the rules will be so different. But uh, let's think about this and, uh, and find uh, smart uh, uh, decisions in order to break uh, Kremlin's wall. Okay, what do you think about that? Do you think this is a new generation of diplomacy which is needed and that we need to invest long term? The Russians, for example, they're not thinking about five, ten years. They're building their own form of the European Union without a parliament, by the way. And they already have the Berlimont building in place, so they're learning from our mistakes. And they, they want to see a, a, a new generation of a union, uh, but they're thinking 30, 40 years away. Should we be thinking this way too? If you can control what will happen in 40 years, uh, congratulations for them. But I'm very, I'm very pessimistic that you can control, you know, what is happening next six months, uh, not uh, 40 years from now on. So you can build whatever plans you have in this respect because life has its own clock, internal clock. And if you try to make it more rapid, you know, you can broke it. So I think, you know, that life would go in that direction anyway. There will be technological progress. There will be something else which would bring new forms of interaction. For instance, you know, the Romania revolution was on TV. Uh, now the revolutions are on uh, Twitter and uh, on Facebook. So yeah. these go directly, directly to the citizens. That's the point which Elmar was trying to make, that we have to go directly to the citizens, not stay, you know, in front of them and wait for them to see whether they consider us uh, uh, good or not. I think that we should interfere in this respect more. Elmar Brock, in terms of a strategy, what exists now and what needs to be done to achieve that? First, as you said rightly, we have to unite. Let's say the majority has to unite for a joint strategy. We have never a totally united front. That's the dif uh, difference between the Putin system and our democratic system. But then we have to have the readiness and the courage to m fight for opposition with the modern means we have. And here we are partly too weak, and this is a situation that the European Union is still not in a stage on foreign security policy, uh, and, uh, but we are on our way. If I see the Bratislava roadmap, if I see what the defense minister and the foreign minister discuss, if I see Mogherini's proposals uh, for the global strategy, if I see the roadmap for the summit in Rome, then I see that because of the outside threats we have from migration to terror uh, and the uh, external and internal insecurities and also this Russian behavior that the Europeans, the majority of Europeans start to understand that we have to do something together. Therefore, I believe in the last weeks and months we have more progress in that direction. 
Uh, as we had in 10 years before. Okay, let me ask for something more subtle. And for example, uh, Marine Le Pen's party has attracted something like 40 million in Russian finance over the last couple of years. We don't spend anywhere close to that in terms of our activity, uh, Europe's activity in, in Russia. Uh, how do we deal with the Russian influence within political parties, this, this fifth column, uh, which is there, Gilmar Brock and then Tomas? We have to explain that to our people. I say it in, in public debates, even if the people from such parties are there. If the AfD in Germany does make uh, uh, party board meetings in the Russian embassy, then it must be become <laughs> public. And uh, okay. this is uh, the question which we have to talk about. Uh, and uh, I believe that the end of the day will win that. But always, if I remember in the 70s and 80s, how much influence Russian propaganda had in Germany, mass demonstrations for peace, uh, and we know now who had organized that. That is not new. We, we have won it last time, we will win it this time again. Do you agree, Thomas? Going to the citizens and explaining the, the position and explaining why it is important is the first and foremost responsibility of all elected politicians everywhere in any, any democracy. So, yeah, that's right, that's step one. Uh, at the same time, I think that we should not give up on Russian civil society, even though there is a shrinking <coughs> space for anything uh, which is autonomous, which is independent uh, of the Kremlin. We still need to keep up our existing connections and support whatever we, uh, we still find there in terms of civil society, because that's Russia's hope. It's not just our hope, it's Russia's hope for the future. Okay, Ambasco, the, the Kremlin is not the same as the Russian parliament. And from what I'm told, uh, those who have been to, to the Duma say that they feel very isolated from the control of the Kremlin. They don't feel so they have influence. We have sent some, uh, you know, some politicians from here, from this house, have gone to meet with representatives there, and they want to exchange, uh, increase that dialogue. Is that something that you want to see? And would you think it's even fruitful if the Kremlin's hold is so, so strong? Well, you know, provided that uh, this is a uh, genuine effort, that we take uh, at face value, you know, the other side. Yes, maybe, but if this becomes another channel for the Russians to influence us, I wouldn't be so happy with it. Okay, but you still on the blacklist, Petrus? I am. Excellent. And <laughs> oh, thank you very this much. This is like an annual <laughs> Forbes thing where you, you get you get on the list, and if you're not, you're disappointed. <laughs> well, I see no change in the, in, in Russian policy line. I, I guess. Uh, uh, with our recent uh, move, uh, as we sent uh, a letter to uh, uh, Madame Mogherini asking her, I mean, to extend the, so to say, blacklist of Russian Duma members, mm -hmm. those seven who've been elected in illegally annexed and occupied Crimea, which is completely a legal act and based on international law. So I think the, the uh, reciprocity kind of based uh, decision uh, from uh, Kremlin will follow. But uh, I don't think that being on the blacklist of, of Kremlin it's uh, kind of a um, bad thing I mean, to have uh, for, for myself. It's, it's a badge of honor. I agree with this. But completely agree with my colleagues. We, we lost understanding in, in Russia in a post uh, Putin era, I mean, or Putin's era. We need more investments on our side. We need more uh, discussions among ourselves, spreading uh, the information uh, what experts know. That's why I appreciate uh, the uh, report on disinformation and uh, propaganda. Uh, we just adopted at Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. This is the right step forward, and I'm looking forward to I mean, to continue. Okay, you got a question, Camille? Yeah, but how we can stop the Russian propaganda here? That's <laughs> that's the point. I, I think, think Elmo addressed this a little <laughs> bit, but I, I still don't hear a great answer in this. Actually, how do we? How, you know, we have, we have Giles and the, the crew across in, in uh, Berlin, uh, trying to uh, the external action service, trying trying to to come up with some kind of strategy and to train journalists across the eastern borders as well to push back. Is this simply a matter of throwing money at a problem which is essentially no. a, a media problem? I think, I think, you know, that the paradox is the, the more sources of information we have, the more manipulable we are. So therefore, you know, there is a narrative which is coming continuously from Russia. We all know which is uh, that narrative, but at the same time, we have to counter it with our own narrative. Because not everybody would be automatically transformed into a mankurti uh, type of uh, citizen who sees for the first time thing and says, yes, this is the truth. No, we have to compete and try to present to him uh, something which is competitive. Look, uh, why don't you evaluate this truth also? 
because you know everybody's presenting his truth. But it would seem some would say that really before we started talking to the Russian people about uh, counter propaganda measures, we should start dealing with the likes of UKIP and those who have been at least uh, part financed and certainly strongly influenced by by Putin. You know, the number of Putin admirers in the UKIP leadership is, is quite substantial and Front National, we go to other areas of Hungary where they, they admire uh, great strongmen. How do we deal with Europe citizens first to uh, unify that narrative? Tomás. Well, there is one thing which is relatively cheap and I don't even know why it doesn't happen. Uh, because just, it's cheap. Uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, just <laughs> identifying simply in out there in cyberspace what are the sources which are actually directly linked to Russian propaganda. That is not an extraordinary thing to do. Just having a list of those websites which are regularly engaged in what we know to be Russian propaganda would be actually is extremely useful information in our uh, efforts to explain our position as well. That look, we are not competing with, uh, that is not a civil society voice, that is something different that you hear. And that should be relatively easy and relatively cheap. I don't know why we're not doing it. Petrus. I think finally we uh, recognized and admitted yeah. that we are under the hybrid information war from, from Russia. I mean, if Russians use in a systematic way, in an effective way, with huge finances, I mean, information means uh, and propaganda against us, we have big uh, factories of trolls. I mean, those uh, full-time employed, young, smart people speaking many European languages and they tweet and they follow you. They, they try to, um, you know, uh, squeeze you in, into, in, in the public uh, space and, and make some fun out of you. So finally, this recognition came to uh, our side. Now I'm looking forward to uh, effective means of uh, uh, response. And that response, I think we, we should have more investigative journalism being here. I mean, we are not going to have a propaganda uh, commissioner or <laughs> uh, kind Don't of... do we have one? Uh, we well, <laughs> but he will or she will never be a kind of propaganda. Uh, I think we are but stronger in ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So that's why... And we have to decode uh, the message of, um, uh, of Mr. Putin to, to the West. Uh, it's utmost important. And to show our citizens who is behind that. I mean, uh, what are the force, uh, forces in, in Russian which, uh, on the Russian side which, which are so interested in changing our mindset and uh, our rules of life? I don't believe, I mean, we need any change. Elmer, yes, Elmer, go ahead. I think, uh, first of all, we cannot stop it because we are a free society. I repeat myself. Secondly, that was partly said here, we have to make transparent who is the source. Yeah, that's true. Explain which uh, nice uh, foundation is on which payroll. Yes. Not forbid that foundation, as Russia does, as a foreign agent, but <laughs> when we have voted discussions, I know perfectly well that one or two of these other guys are in a German talk show on a payroll from Mr. Putin. And if this is not sad, because we are polite, they can say an impression that me as a German can say, but you have to understand and blah, 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 blah. But if it's clear that he's paid for this sentence, if I see this American and British journalists working for radio today, uh, Russia today, with a very good English, the citizens of the United States and the United Kingdom, and do Russia today. That's right. Uh, they're on about its payroll and not to give an impression that these are American journalists. Gerhard this Schroeder is on Russia's payroll. <laughs> but he is not <laughs> for propaganda, he's only for money responsible. But this, I think, is one of the two good occasions that everyone in Germany knows that he's on Putin's payroll. <laughs> so that is public. So it's transparent. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, an element of transparency. So let me ask, we're going to finish up now. So let me ask just one uh, question, quick answer. Uh, let's start with uh, Petrus first. When you look at the next five years, and I know it's impossible to predict really what's going to happen, but would you have confidence that Europe itself would have a strong strategy to deal with Russia within the next five years? I think we have no alternative as, uh, as to follow this line. If we show our weaknesses, uh, you know, it will be a defeat not just for the European Union. It will be a great defeat for many countries which we invited for partnership and association agreements. So that's why I'm so ho hopeful that, for example, the reform process in Ukraine, in Moldova, in Georgia will, uh, will reach certain results. And this is, by the way, 
one of the biggest weapon in our side showing the Russian society what you can do once you follow normal reforms based on experience, democracy and rule of law. Ian Pasco? I think we should do it. I agree with, uh, with my friend here, you know, that uh, we have to do it. And uh, I think that there are good signs that we started to understand the need for cohesion and for coherence in our attitude and common attitude and the importance of unity. I think, you know, these, these things are there. We can build upon them. Okay, Tomas, quickly. There will not be any major disagreement here. Yes, there, there's a, there are a large number of policy areas where we finally realize that we need a strategy and the common strategy. Russia is just one among them. And of course, as long as we can do it transparently and in an accountable fashion, that's the only way the European Union can survive. Okay. Do you see it within five years? Is it going to happen quickly? I don't know, because it is totally uh, Putin's decision. What we have to do to make it clear where we do disagree, where we have sanctions, but we should, should also uh, show that we are open for partnership okay. if the th conditions by Russia are fulfilled. fulfilled. Okay, let me just summarize. Europe is open for partnerships, as Elmer Brock. The cost of war for Putin has to be accounted as well. He must be made to, uh, to be accountable, at least for the cost of what he's doing. Uh, that he's trying to be a spoiler anywhere. Uh, so it's a mass measure. Uh, yes, and uh, Gorbachev says there's a nuclear threat, but uh, the failed economy is perhaps a greater threat to the leadership of, of a mafia state. But uh, it, like Don Corleone, there's always somebody coming up next. So is there going to be stability in Russia, uh, even if there's no Putin there? The level of disruption across West society is designed to undermine Western uh, institutions and uh, that uh, may continue to increase but the, 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 the prospect of military force is to be avoided but the inc an increase of economic force could be a way forward with this and uh, this is a zero sum, -sum game uh, for Russia but Russia uh, also has a long-term strategy uh, to build and uh, to incorporate other states around it but Europe has to take the same view as well, to be patient with uh, the integration and the projects it has underway with likes of Moldova and to invest in the future of Russian youth and European youth as well. Let me thank our guests uh, here also today. Ian Pasco from uh, Romania, Elmar Brock from Germany, Petr Sarsarvicius uh, from Lithuania, Tomas Mezerich from Hungary, and our students, Camille and Tamea. Thank you very much all indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.